Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Would you like to come and take a seat? Or stand at the back? There's one seat down here. Substitute bench, yeah. <laughs> We've got 12 readers this evening because we're celebrating 10 years of Cinnamon Press, which is just an extraordinary thing to have been part of. And hopefully the next 10 years will be just as amazing with fantastic books coming out from people like Cathy Miles next year, Hazel's next book, lots of wonderful things in the forward program but this year is is all about celebrating where we've come from and particularly tonight where we've come from in terms of the writers from wales which is a huge part of the cinnamon family and the, at the core of what we do and what we publish i'm not going to say great long introductions because there's quite a few of us to get through except that these writers are all stunning they're all on this list because they love their writing, they are passionate about their subjects, <coughs> they are all people who walk around with their senses open to the world and know how to take what they see and experience, what they've researched, whether it's historical or present day, whether it's landscape, whether it's place, whether it's people, and how to channel that for all of you to read. There's tons of our books around, which is really exciting to see. Mm -hmm. Simon doesn't want any of them left in the bookshop. Mm -hmm. It must now be well under 70 days to Christmas. So you can do everything this evening. You can just clean up, and you'll have no more Christmas shopping to do, because what more could people want than books? <laughs> so first of all, please welcome John Barney. Thanks, Jan. And, uh, Congratulations on the 10th anniversary. It's Simon has made a real mark, I think, has become a real presence in Welsh publishing in the last 10 years due to hard work and commitment. And it's much appreciated by those of us who we published. Uh, I'll just read two poems from a collection published by Simon called The Roaring Boys. The first is called Funeral at Llanbadan. It's got a kind of glancing reference to two poems by Davlap Gwilym. Mechid Shambaran, the girls of Shambaran, and uh, Erwilan, the girls. So, funeral at Shambaran. David Abji is eyeing the girls, but most are old and dressed like penitents. If anything had been completed, there'd be a rainbow in the sky instead of greasy rain on tarmac. And David's messengers, the girls, testing their stomach's acidity on Slambaran's trash. We file out and shake hands with the widow in the wet gleam of December. Is and was two little words that are passed through like a revolving door. The other poem is the title poem of the book, The Roaring Boys, Er Kovam Yuan Shuid in memory of you and Fluid. Of all the poets I have known, it's the Roaring Boys I remember best. They roared through Canada and the United States. They roared through Germany and France. They roared through England. But best of all, they roared through Wales. They wrote on anything, bits of paper, notebooks of a special kind, the backs of their father's wills. They wrote even when they reached the edge of the endless sea. Death is unique. He has no mother, and God is afraid of him. When he came for the boys, wait, one said, I have an angling to write. Another snatched him and kissed him on his beaky lips. A last glass of cool white wine, said a third. Death had visited Keats and Jeffers, Wordsworth and Thomas R.S. But the Roaring Boys, he said, I will never forget. A disgrace to their nation and its glory, stumbling through time like the road to a tavern, 
where the landlord had the glasses primed because he knew they were coming with a thirst and an appetite as they burst through the sunlit doors. One of the things that we've done this year to mark the 10th anniversary is this anthology, Meet Me There, which looks at sense of place and 10 of our authors, I think seven of them from Wales and a couple from Scotland and one from England, have come together to kind of write about how they write about place. And Mark Charlton's book was probably the book that inspired me to want to do this. He writes beautifully about sense of place. Please welcome Mark Charlton. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to read you this piece from my book, Counting Steps, um, about Pembrokeshire, and also just mentioned by coincidence my good friend John Nat Fisher, who died earlier this year. Um, it's called The White Tower. If anyone's been to Pop Guy, they might know it. <coughs> On the low sloping cliff to the north of Potgain is a white tower. It is made from field stone, about the size of a small kiln, mortared with mud and lime. The tower is one of two markers that indicate safe passage to the harbour. A few years ago, its starboard sister was struck by lightning, I'm told. The locals rebuilt it, for in a heavy storm, the fishermen need these towers still. I walked there yesterday, alone on a December morning. I'd forgotten a scarf, my ears sore in the wind. As I climbed the sticky mud path, a flock of curlews flew, flew from the sand by the slip. They rose to the crumbling walls of the hoppers that loom over the quay. The hoppers, a relic of Potgain's industrial past, once stored the graded rocks that were loaded onto sloops bound for Liverpool and Newport. Looking north, I felt the curve of the ocean folding over my shoulder. The light at Strumble was flashing, and I could make out Puff Derry Hostel between Garn Bower, the big cairn. Yesterday the sea was flat, a gunmetal grey, darkening to a pewter horizon. Lobster pods bobbed in the marbled swell. I have stood here in other Decembers, drenched as the waves swallow the cliffs and clots of spume settle as if it were snow on the dun grass. In the lee of the stack, I thought of the times I have come here, the years of looking, of painting the view, counting boats. I remembered too, our boys running round it, and how Jane said it was the magic tower, five times for luck, five more to earn a wish. They used to hold the coats above their heads, leaning and screaming into the breeze. As I made to leave, I had a sudden urge to measure the tower's circumference. Holding my arms at full stretch, I sidled round, hugging the pockmarked stones. Its girth is four and a half spans, and I have the whitewash on my fleece to prove it. Two gulls were circling above. They were blackbacks, dismissive of the kestrel that hovered in the ridge lift, its tail held flat for balance, down and into the wind. The tower is one of my returning places, one of six or seven locations to which I am repeatedly drawn. These are not large areas, such as Pembrokeshire or the Eleneth, but my delight in those landscapes when I visit them more than most. My returning places are specific, somewhat peculiar, not in the tourist brochures. They are places I come to as if in ritual, places that hold significance I don't fully understand. My family joke about it. Can't we go somewhere new, they say. The older boys suddenly have homework, friends to visit, or arrangements that couldn't possibly be broken. Increasingly, I go alone. Last year, I drove 400 miles to a windswept crag. For an hour, I sat in the bracken between the sandstorms and watched geese flying south. Then I drove home. Nostalgia is heroin for old people, my eldest son ribbed me this Christmas. He has the confidence of youth and a healthy dismissal of his father's habits. When his girlfriend first came to our house, he advised her, don't talk to my dad, he's a bit weird. It was she who told me this as she teased him for his similarity to me. I reminded him too of the hundred mile journey he'd made to be with her on their anniversary. This wasn't nostalgia, he replied, and I'm sure he's right. He's right too that I have a tendency to reminisce. I could spend hours flicking through the albums in my study, pictures of me as a young man, of Jane who so besotted me, of my boys asleep as toddlers, their arms intertwined. 
but it's wrong to assume my visits to the tower are merely nostalgic, for the sea is too close, the wind and the surge too immediate. In places like this, our senses are alert, we feel part of it, truly alive, and yet we feel small, insignificant even, no more able to escape the cycle of growth and decay than are the cliffs, the waves, or the kestrel hovering in the wind. On my way back to the car, I looked across the harbour to the other tower. It is higher than mine and not so white. For the first time I noticed its top was shaped to a fine point resembling a sharpened pencil. It struck me that in the twenty years I've been coming to Porthgain, I have perhaps been to that tower twice. This is strange, for it stands less than fifty yards off the path to Aberivi, a walk I know intimately. The path takes its steps by the pilot house where it meets the old tramway. The track is sunken into the land, a sort of hollow, excuse me, a sort of, oops, can't read, a sort of hollow way that emerges the quarry where Chuff's nest and I saw my first cloud of yellow butterfly. Round to the west are the headland fingers of Penclegger, which create the tidal reef off the, reef off the beach of Unasbarry. Not long after I came here, a father swam to his son who was struggling in the ebb. The son made it to shore. The man's body was found in Cardigan Bay. There, are white horse, there were white horses that day. I remember because I'd arranged to go surfing with a friend and was checking the waves when the maroon went up. I returned to find his car gone and was furious that he'd buggered off before someone told me that he was on a lifeboat. He could have said I meant. I was like that then. When Jane was first pregnant, we'd often walk on that beach. Once we found an abandoned seal pup, bloodied from the storms, and wondered if its mother would return. Jane asked me if I thought I'd give my life for a child of my own. My reply was cold, a philosophy on the relative value of adult and infant lives. She reminds me of that sometimes. I was thinking of this as I drove home, stopping to see my neighbour, the artist John Nat Fisher. John is perhaps the finest landscape painter in Wales. For 40 years he has lived and worked from his cottage cum gallery two miles from the harbour. As we chatted, I noticed the tiny watercolour of a bare field, the furrows white with snow, trees stark against the brittle sky. It was dated 1962, and the sticker said, not for sale. I painted it for my father, he said. The strange thing is, I remember everything about that day. The smell of the field, the trees thick with frost. I remember the brush strokes, the colour of my water, the taste of paint on my lips. He peered closely, as if looking for the first time. Everything he said again. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Miles' poems in The Shadow House are ex astonishing. Her next book is even better. But at the moment, she's having a slight hiatus from writing because she's just won the Bridport Prize. So she wrote a poem that's so good that she's not sure now what to write next. <laughs> but we know it's going to be incredible. Please welcome Kathy Miles. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I'll read you three poems. Um, the first one is uh, Red Kite. Above the cloisters of soil and shrub, she hovers in her incredible red, wings scorching the air, as she spools across fields of sheaves and cut stubble. Jackdaws spin like flecks of grey ash, girdle her with a jabber of black, tugging the air with their loud complaints. She tilts into the wind, her call a high frail on the currents, and her shadow falls across the pond and the slow leaps as she circles her heft, a shawl of rain misting the hedges, the redshift of her feathers quilled against the sun. Above a dissonance of stars, the sooty of day fading into evening, moon unfolding its yellow eye. And um, the uh, next poem, um, as you know, it's the um, 50 years since the valley of uh, Capelkelen, uh, through where it was flooded to make um, way for a reservoir for water for the people of Liverpool. Um, I was actually growing up in Liverpool at the time, so I'm afraid I bear the guilt of being one of those people for which the 
um, that the village and the valley was flooded. Um, <clears throat> and it did occur to me that nobody had actually written anything about uh, it from that point of view. So um, this is my, po my take on it. Remembering Castle Kellen. In our greed, we thought you didn't need the water. The valley's bowl already blown with rain, the surplus drained inside a soak of earth. Yet sometimes I could hear Dur slip silent into the sink, words slither down the windows like a melt of winter ice. Our valleys were the railway cuttings, Edge Hill, Olive Mount, that slow slide into Lime Street, the city dragging easy on its smoke. We had spoiled our water. The dredged river, dull and sullen, glass, you would say, sheened with oil, blue as magpie feathers. So we wanted your water like Hiraeus, bringing us the soft glow of rain, scents of sheep and meadows hooking our roots. For we were Welsh too, our names cutched away by marriage, loved the hidden lyric of our streets, Prulas and Powys, Dovey, Madrim, Winstay, Tylo, Gwent. Our aunts with their secret handshake of fowls behind those doors our heritage had closed. A nine and tied too, with raw weather skin and roughened hands, how they'd sit in the garden late on summer days and long into evening look towards the hills, the heathered sky. Come here, Carriad, see Molvama, Snowdon, your Mamgi's land. Your dead were drowned for us, bones floated underground, school books submerged, their language sunk beneath the reservoir. Now in our baths, lots tongues sound, the toll of chapel bell, a faint smell of ashes, doused inside the chimney stacks, the hoil of Sunday sermons. In our basins are roofs, mossed stone, a chip of brick, clanging from the pipes like angry ghosts. Your water tumbles from our taps, clear and sleek as a mountain stream, tastes like an accusation on my lips. And the final poem I'm going to read is uh, the one that won the Bridport. Um, um, what I want to say about it, it's in memory of the lace makers of Chantilly and the sisters of Compiègne, which were two groups of people who were killed in the French Revolution. The lace makers of Chantilly were killed for supplying lace to the aristocracy, in particular, obviously, in effort to Marie Antoinette. Um, but the sisters of Compiègne were also lace makers, and they were killed for their religious devotion. So I've kind of set, the, uh, set it in the cloisters, um, and this is uh, from the viewpoint of one of the nuns. An elegy for lace. In late afternoon, a tapestry of apples Shadows stippled on the orchard's hem. Scents of garlic and wild violet, the linnet keening on the wind, a slur of sun in the grass. A dragonfly, his wings stretched webs of thread, rises in the bleach of evening dusk. Our hands, a quiet prayer of lace, inside the honeyed stone of the cloister walls. We loop the silky tussles of yarn, twist and plait, cross them over and over, shape them into shawls and veils, a fichu to be placed round the neck of a comtesse or a queen. Bone and ivory bobbins click like needles, the click of cl ship's masts at their mooring, as we link meshed nets of grenadine across a resu ground, each strip separate to itself, white as flaked ice, our fingers raw from the prick of holding pins. <coughs> The lark embroidered his song into our intricate work, yet the blessed sky darkens. Night cuts the earth like a wetted blade. I grow afraid, sisters. I grow so afraid. Thank you. Our next reader has come all the way from Paris via Chandidna. She's coming crosses two boundaries because her partner is Parisian and her next novel will be set partly in Paris and partly in India as is Kanya Kumari, her first novel which is set at the very tip of India. Please welcome Hazel Manuel.
Thank you. Um, I love putting myself in situations where I feel like an outsider. Um, I'm a <coughs> Londoner, but I moved um, to Wales, to the wilderness of Mid Wales, when I was 19, with nothing but my 19-year-old boyfriend, a box of oranges and a sack of rice, um, <laughs> and made a, a life in, in Wales. Um, I now, for the last two and a half years, I've lived in France, in Paris. I didn't speak French when I moved there, but um, I've done my best to learn, and it's very intriguing, again, moving to another a place, a country, a culture where everything is new, everything is dis different. I've spent a lot of my life, when I can, when I've had the opportunity traveling, um, and I've uh, really been quite lucky, I've done some very interesting travel. Um, I've, uh, I've walked, um, trekked the Sahara Desert with nothing, all, all the essentials, a sat-nav, a map, and a Frenchman, no guide. <laughs> Very similarly, I, I rode uh, a horse from Argentina to Chile. All the essentials again, two guides, four gauchos, a Frenchman. <laughs> Always take a Frenchman. Um, and I've, I've been lucky enough to travel in Iceland and China um, and, and Syria, very fortunately, I feel very, very sad when I, I see um, that beautiful, lovely country and, and what's happened now. And, and so for me, for me, I was very, very happy. I was very pleased to be asked to contribute to this, this wonderful book, Meet Me There, which is full of fabulous writings by great writers, um, which, as Jan said before, explores the theme of place and, and really explores what that means from different perspectives for, for different people. And from, for me, what I love is putting myself in cultures, countries that are very different from my own landscapes, that are different from my own languages, religions, etc., that I don't understand, partly because I'm really intrigued by people and by their way of life and, and by uh, being able to learn from that, and, and partly because it's exciting and it helps me to understand something about myself when I'm in a situation where I have to push my own boundaries and where I can't use all my taken-for-granted rules that I've learned growing up. Um, and so um, I, I thought hard about what I wanted to contribute to this, this book. And um, as Jan said, I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time in India, I've been there four times. I've worked there a little bit, and I lived with a, an Indian family for a little while. Um, and my my first book is set in India, and that was of all the places I've visited, all the places I've travelled. I think for me, India was the most profound for many, many reasons. And so that was what I decided as part of my contribution for this book was was to talk about why India and and how India affected me in a sense. So what I'll read is, is just a little part of uh, my, my chapter um, that explores that. My first novel takes its name from India's southernmost town. Kanyakumari is typically South Indian with bustling markets, vibrant temples, a profusion of people, rickshaws, scooters, cows and dogs all contributing to the general clamour and all set against the backdrop of the meeting place of three oceans, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean. Here, the towering statue of the great Tamil philosopher-poet Thiruvallavar stands sentinel from his little island in the bay, surveying a town quite literally at the end of the earth. Kanyakumari has no airport, and the train from Delhi, India's capital city, takes around 50 hours. The appeal of taking my readers to such a richly sensuous and enigmatic place was irresistible. This, however, was not the only reason I chose Kanyakumari as my book setting. In my opinion, all childhood profundity happens at the age of eight, and it was at this age that I first became aware of a dream. It wasn't an actual dream, but rather an image, an idea, a shade. A sense of an archetypical tale began to form in my imagination, a tale that was never to leave me. I don't know where it came from. Fairy tales, perhaps, the myths and legends that unbound themselves from my confines of their pa from the confines of their pages and whispered to my <coughs> subconscious mind. 
Or perhaps it was simply an eight-year-old's expression of the mysteries inherent in growing up. I don't know. But from wherever it came, the beauty of what I dreamed defied my ability to fully express it. The story began, as do all self-respecting romances, with a quest. Quests, by their nature, are tough. We know their beginning, and we know what we seek. But what happens between is a challenge whose purpose is to lead us away from what is familiar and onto the road to transformation. I looked into the heart of my quest and saw a dark path winding off into some undefined future. And I knew that what lay at its end was so profound, so vast in its import, that if I reached it, I would forever be changed. Perhaps the quest was about coming of age, becoming the adult I'd eventually be, finding wholeness or finding home. I don't know. But I called it the search for the big orange poetry flower. And so I had to look for this flower. I knew that the instant I laid my eyes on its petals, breathed its perfume, that at once all the poetry, all the music, all the creative intoxication of the universe would be released and my soul, unable to resist, would follow it out of my body and into the vastness that lies beyond time, merging, becoming one with the great unity on which true reality is built. The quest would be over, and I would be complete. One more thing I knew, even all those years ago, that my search would end in India. It was to be many years before I travelled there. I grew my hair long, I found causes to fight for, and I wrote some dismal teenage poetry about my quest. But I, perhaps like most, became caught up in the mundane excitement of education, family and career, and my orange flower was left to lie waiting inside the fragility of my memory. But I always knew I'd go to India someday. And finally, one unremarkable springtime, I went. I hadn't intended Kanya Kamari to be a novel. On that first trip, I found myself overflowing with emotions, impressions and questions, and I began writing in my journal on the flight home as a way to process what I felt. I didn't stop writing, and over the coming weeks and months, characters began to emerge, the beginnings of a plot, an intrigue. Like my old quest, I didn't know how the story would end, but I trusted my intuition and I trusted India. And it began to dawn on me that I was writing a book. <coughs> it was a most happy revelation, and I returned to India twice more to immerse myself and my story in the colors, the smells, the sounds, in the pulsating, confounding, enriching world that is India. I see all journeys as quests. Even if we're not searching in the spiritual sense, I believe that when we travel, we are looking to inhabit the world in a new way, to experience ourselves differently. I think, too, that this is often why we read. No one ends where they begin, neither in life nor in fiction. My Indian quest, my search for this big orange poetry flower, wasn't for me the classic search for a true self. Maybe over time it had become an, uh, an expression of that bittersweet yearning for home that the Welsh call hiraeth, that we all sometimes feel, even when we are at the place we call home. <clears throat> I saw in India that regardless of colour, creed or country, what unites us is stronger and more vital than what separates us. Even so, India remains to me a very foreign place. I connected with it strongly, but trying to understand a culture and a way of life so very different to our own is akin to learning a new language. Only gradually do we begin to grasp its enigmas. For me, evoking a powerful sense of India by creating a novel from the meandering stream of consciousness that appeared on the pages of my journal allowed me to explore what it is to be an outsider not understanding the customs, the culture, or the languages, my characters struggle to understand their surroundings and the people around them. The foreignness of the country reflects their growing sense of isolation and their need to resolve this. 
Perhaps this was the meaning of my quest, creating a sense of place that is vivid and vibrant in its depiction of India enabled me to explore this sense of differentness, of otherness, we all sometimes feel, even when we're not in a foreign country. India, then, was not only a wonderfully evocative back backdrop to my novel, but was, in a sense, a metaphor for that existential loneliness we feel when we don't understand our relationship with the world around us. So did I find my big orange poetry flower? Well, over the years I've spent a lot of time in India, traveling, working, learning, and what I've discovered is a country I don't understand, where I feel alien yet at home, infuriated and fascinated, a country that is so hard to be in but so difficult to leave, whose people, religions, cities and landscapes have captured my imagination so deeply that the only way to process it is artistically. The big orange poetry flower turned out to be my novel, and I realized that in Kanya Kamari. <clears throat> Don't see them both, but Matthew Francis has written two amazing books for Simon Press. The first one, Singing a Man to Death, was shortlisted for Wales Book of the Year. Fiction Prize and is an extraordinary collection of short stories. The second one is the most amazing novel. The character is just, I just don't know how he makes it to the end of it alive. <laughs> he is um, so innocent and so oblivious to what's going on in the world around him in, in quite humorous ways, and yet it's such a serious story. Just extraordinary pressure on language, on research, because he's actually based on a real person. Please welcome Matthew Francis. <clears throat> Thank you, Jan. I'm going to read from that novel, which is called Book of the Needle. And um, it's, uh, as Jan said, it's based on a real person. The, the Welsh um, tailor, uh, Arise Evans, in the 17th century, uh, the era of the, uh, of the Civil War, and he, uh, he prophesied uh, that the Civil War would take place, and he prophesied that the king would come back. He was a great royalist, so he, he, he believed he had a sort of uh, hotline to God, and, and God was talking to him and telling him, giving him all these messages. And some of the messages turned out to be true. Some of them turned out to be complete, complete nonsense, and he was totally incapable of knowing the difference. Um, <laughs> but this is uh, going to be the shortest chapter in the novel, which is about a real historical event, it's called, the, the event is known as the Burning of the Rump. And this took place in February 1660, uh, just before the restoration of King Charles II. So what's happened is that Oliver Cromwell has died. Um, he was succeeded by his son, Richard Cromwell, who was a complete failure. And after, Crom after Richard Cromwell um, was deposed, there was a, a power struggle between various warlords. And all of them really exhausted their credit with the people very quickly. And... Uh, the people basically said they didn't want any of these people anymore, any of, the, any of these, these, these uh, Puritan uh, overlords that they'd had. The <coughs> Rump Parliament had been recalled. Um, it was called the Rump Parliament because Cromwell had got rid of most of its members, but it was, it was rec recalled, and it still had most of the power. But in February 1660, there were, there were riots in London. There was a kind of strange sort of demonstration where people demonstrated their, their disapproval of the, of, the, um, of the Parliament by symbolically burning or barbecuing, really, rump steaks. And this actually happened. It was, it was their demonstration of disapproval, and, and the next thing that happened was that the, ki the king came back. Now, Rise Evans, as a, as a staunch royalist, was delighted by this. Um, that was exactly what he wanted to see happen. So this is a, an account of that, that incident, the burning of the rump. <coughs> the sky was red. I had to press against the wall as far from the middle of the street as possible because of the heat of the bonfires, so many that there was no longer any darkness between them. St. Margaret's was ringing, and St. Martin in the Fields, and St. Clement Danes, St. Dunstan's, St. Andrew's, St. Bride's, the Temple, Blackfriars, Bow Bells, the Great Bells of St. Paul's, all ringing together and out of step like a battle fought by angels. In King Street, they were marching up and down, holding long poles like pikes in the air. A few drops of something splashed into my face as I passed. I tasted what I thought was rain, and understood suddenly that it was blood. I was seized by the fear that the things on the end of the poles might be human heads. They were hunched and reddish, and seemed to be gripping the poles 
by their own will, like squirrels. Then I recognized them. The men were parading pieces of meat, the biggest steaks I had ever seen. At the place in the Strand still called the Maypole, where the Maypole itself was torn down by order of the Parliament some 15 years previously, I met with a troop of aproned butchers, all holding a great knife in each hand and clashing them together to make a peal to rival that of the bells. Having finished their ceremony, they turned to a red and white carcass they had dragged with them on a hurdle, and one carved off its haunches very lovingly, while the others held it, slipping the meat from the bone. A boy seized one, tied it to a long pole, and hung it over the flames while the men shouted at him over the, over the din, Don't you burn it, Nathan, some of us are hungry. <laughs> no, said another, let the bastard burn, we can eat any day. The boy must have been a year or two younger than Owen, his son. Feeling me push past him, he seemed to take offence and pointed to his backside. Kiss my parliament, said he. <laughs> I staggered on, my face stinging, and above all, my diseased nose, which always pained me most when it came close to any fire. The air was savoury with the smell of roasting beef and mutton, which reminded me that I too was hungry. At Temple <coughs> Bar, they were executing a piece of meat over a bonfire, hanging it from a small gibbet they had built for the purpose. Further along Fleet Street, they had just finished roasting, and a woman came up to me with a platter full of hot beef. I ate two slices with my fingers and took a couple of ale with it. It is the rump, said she. You mean the Parliament? It is overthrown? We will not have any of them any more, said she. Not Speaker Lenthorne, nor Lord Lambert, nor any more Cromwells. We have had this one and that, one after another, and they were all the same. Then the King must come in. We don't hold with the King neither. But they are all the same. We should rule ourselves now. Where did you come by all the meat? asked I. We won't need... What say you? I can't hear. We'll not need food any more. Parliament... She was carried away by the press of people. I had eaten and drunk too quickly and felt the unchewed meat lurking in my gullet, waiting its time to return. At Ludgate Hill, I rested by another bonfire where a man was turning a spit and another was basting it viciously with some liquid that angered the flames and made them strike out at him. Both men were too close to the fire, but perhaps they could not be burnt now any more than they would need food tomorrow. From this eminence, I could see a dozen more splashes of fire reflected in the Thames and others beyond in Southwark and Lambeth. The shape of the city could be seen in the sky, darkness at the horizon where the surrounding fields were, and a circle of glow within, a glory. They do not yet know yet that the king is coming in, thought I. They are happy without even knowing the reason of it, thinking it is enough to burn the parliament. But he is coming, and sooner than they think. There is his crown. I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm Adam Craig. I'm, I'm a Johnny come lately to the cinnamon uh, empire in waiting. Um, I was just sitting here slightly distracted because I was looking to see some of my book covers. I, I designed some of these books. I think, gosh, my books are here <laughs> in a bookshop on display. Um, but I'm not here to talk about my books. I'm talking about our next reader. Jan Fortune is not only an amazing publisher and a stunning editor, and I am biased, I, should, I suppose I should disclose that I am very biased about it since we are engaged to be married. Um, Jan is also a really stunning writer, he humbly says. Um, she's written novels and poetry <coughs> and has written, for my money, one of the best prose poetry books ever written. Celebrate Miracles, but she's not going to read from that tonight. She's going to read from Immortal, I think, we've just decided. Um, this is a superb book. This is the first hardback book that Cinnamon published. Um, still there. We'll argue about that in a minute. Jan is a superb uh, performer of her work. She's also a great writer, as you will now see. Jan Fortune, ladies and gentlemen. Two for one in this. It was co-written with Major Sculliver, who wrote about the Slate Islands in Scotland while I was writing about Camorthin, which is a slate valley just above the house where I live. And um, it's just an extraordinary place where this 
absolutely idyllic, quiet, still place around a lake with ruins. It looks so beautiful. Um, the sad part of that is that it also represents quite a lot of emptying out of industry and identity in the area. And whilst Cumorthin was known as the slaughterhouse, and had the highest death rate of any of the slate mines, it also represented a bastion of language and culture and philosophy and religion. So there's a kind of both and thing going on there. And I vis was visiting it a lot during a period when there was a similar pull going on in my life because there was a very long-term relationship coming to an end. So it begins with a series of prose poems and one of them is about the only building that's left standing that isn't falling down. And it's, I called it T. Schrodinger because it's sealed and I had that sense that you couldn't see inside the box. The one remaining house is closed, windows boarded, padlocks guard the doors. Inside, unseen inhabitants, their lives already passed, are yet alive and dead until the seal gives way to break the spell. We know that they are gone, the dead, not smeared into some living, dying life inside the box, not caught between, but do not know the how or when the murk of maybes became death. And in our box, we wait until the measurement is made. I wrote this in a, in a sequence of different kind of forms, including <coughs> nursery rhymes and some found poetry. And the last section kind of brings um, the whole together. And there's another T. Schrodinger <coughs> poem, which I wrote for um, one of our, my friends and authors, Omar, T. Schrodinger III. You say mystery makes sacrament, but my closed door is proof against profane, but today the roof has split, snow and ice nor tiles, splinter slates, the door is rupturing. I can't see in, wonder if those lives unseen ever existed at all. We cannot write of death, approach only to find soul broken by memory slice of a moment in which we taste, exile, return, an ecstasy, already not yet. And then the last poem from the sequence is called Return to Timerian, which is the name of the house I live in. I want a house, secluded, a place to keep the chaos out, a granite womb, slung against slate, hills, the sound of birds hurtling to stake their claims, while wind intones its lullaby. We become so used to fractured days, to weeks spent keeping one step <coughs> ahead of the rains, to months when all we can do is mend the fence, then mend the fence, then mend the fence, to endless years, when it is enough to name the things that anchor us. This photograph of a younger face, this picture book that I read to them a thousand times, this yellow shell, this scrap of slate. I want this place, a foot on the crumbling earth. our authors write about quite distant places and Liz Porter's novel Stranger Visitor Foreigner Guest which is wonderful because every time people say it they get the title in a different order <laughs> um, it's set in Africa Liz will tell you a little bit more about it please welcome Elizabeth Porter <laughs> so uh, Stranger Visitor Foreigner Guest takes place uh, starts off on Zanzibar and moves to mainland Tanzania and it takes place in the present and in the past. And I'm going to read a bit about Christmas Day in 1873 
which was the day when Sir Bartle Freer, uh, the colonial administrator who had got the Sultan of Zanzibar to sign a treaty ostensibly to end slavery, uh, Sir Bartle Freer laid the foundation stone of the Anglican Cathedral on Christmas Day in 1873. Um, the Anglican Cathedral was built on the site of the old uh, slave market. So he's a very, very minor character in this bit. But my narrator is Lucy. And Lucy is a young woman who's gone out to Zanzibar. She's been there a few months with her father. They've gone out as missionaries. Uh, her father's a doctor. And Lucy is trying to be a nurse um, under the supervision of a super competent British nurse called Martha Milton. Uh, Lucy's not a very good nurse. And she's not a very good missionary either. She is fascinated by the Sultanate. She knows she shouldn't be, but she is. Um, ever since her first evening on Zanzibar, when she saw the princesses of the harem uh, process through the stone town, as they do at, at dusk and dawn every day. And she has managed to wangle herself uh, an invitation to teach the princesses chess in the harem. And she's done that via a rather unlikely friendship she has with the Khatib, who is the Sultan's secretary. So this is Christmas Day on Zanzibar in 1873. I woke with a startle and a thrill to the music of a joyous carillion ringing in our Lord's birth just for a moment. Then I went to the window and gazed wistfully upon the princesses, jangling their bells, celebrating their brief freedom. At ten, we set out for the cathedral. My only shawl was the enveloping heat. I wore lace gloves, and yet my fingers chafed on the handle of my parasol, and the leather binding of my missile became sticky as I clutched it. Father ambled, took his hat off, waved it around as a fan, put it on, took it off again. Poor father feels the heat even more than I do. I'd rather be at work he murmured to himself, I think. But then we heard Dr. Hemmings, Lucy, and the clip-clop of hooves echoing on stone. And there she was, illuminated at the end of an alley, in a gown of the same ferocious blue as the sky, and a huge straw hat, tied, unusually for her, with pink ribbons. Father brightened as he moved towards her. I couldn't help saying, but, Nurse Milton, I thought you were going to open the dispensary today as normal. Ignoring me, she dismounted and spoke to Father. Have you met Sir Bartle Freer before? So, I had offended her again. I am becoming inured to her dissatisfaction, but I didn't have time to ponder her change of mind before we arrived at the cathedral. It's a magnificent building, a fitting testament to the generosity of our English benefactors. Pity the sandstone bricks for the colour of dried blood. Inside, the cool descended like a blessing. How strange to see those pews filled with Arabs, all politely facing the altar they do not believe in. Some looking rather ill at ease, others bizarrely at home, lolling in their pews, admiring the cross-stitch hassocks which Martha Milton's mission girls have been making. Up in the organ loft, an invisible musician began the first hymn. I was curious to see whether the Arabs would stand. Some did, some didn't. We sang. Then the workmen, in clean green aprons, made a respectful semicircle, and the bishop presented our honoured guest with a trowel and a hod. Poor sweltering Sir Bartle spread the grey cement, thick as butter, and then set the stone in place. It was a shock to me that Sir Bartle began his speech by thanking Sultan Bargash. Does the parent thank the child after whipping it? I'm not sure Bargash understood the speech, because nobody seemed to be interpreting for him. When we Christians processed to the altar, I wondered what the Arabs made of our Eucharistic feast. Has anyone explained to them how we partake of Christ's body and his blood? One bearded gentleman in a long white garment tried to join the line of communicants. 
bishop's face betrayed a flicker of amusement, and then he whispered to his young African acolyte, who led the gentleman aside. On my way back from the altar, I scanned the Arab ranks, but the Khatib wasn't there, and as I sat down between Martha Milton and Father, I was surprised by my disappointment. But later, my spirits rose. My spirits soared. Ibrahim can now roast a fowl quite decently, and Father looked happier than he had been for months as he carved the bird, poured wine, proposed a toast to the future. Martha Milton contributed a plum pudding sent from Surrey by her aunt. There was an ugly scene in the courtyard when the maids almost came to blows over the best way to cook it. Zainab insisted it should be fried in oil. Pilly wanted to chop it up and stew it with spinach. We left the pudding bubbling safely in a pot of water while Alicia ran to the dispensary to collect the bottle of brandy Martha Milton had forgotten. When she returned, I asked, may Alicia watch? Of course she may, Father said, and doused the pudding in brandy and then set a match to it. How we all laughed when Alicia gasped at the blue flames and clapped her hands to her face in horror. It's spoilt. I shall keep you a piece to taste, I said, and then you shall see it isn't spoilt at all. It'll be such a treat. Don't be disappointed, Lucy, Martha Milton warned. European food tends to disagree with the native stomach. After our meal, I went down to the courtyard with a slice of pudding and Alicia licked her lips and ate up every last scrap. When I returned to the parlour, Father and Martha Milton were sitting side by side on the sofa, <coughs> contemplating a large parcel wrapped in silver tissue on the rug before them. It was as if they were afraid to touch it. Gift, I said. Where did that come from? The room smelled of roses. It was delivered just now, said Father. It's for you. For me? Father's earlier jolly mood had gone. Martha Milton was silent, her face blank. There's a note. He appeared reluctant to pass it to me. But the name on the folded cream paper was mine, in a hand I recognised. I read the brief note aloud with tremulous pleasure. The Sultan wishes to thank Miss Hemmings for teaching the princesses chess. A tiny grunt from Martha Milton's pursed lips. Huh. Shall I open it now? I knelt on the rug and folded back layer after layer of silver tissue paper until at last was revealed a house, a miniature palace of rosewood inlaid with mother of pearl in an intricate interlocking design that could have been stars or moons or crosses. The roof had a gold catch. I unlatched it and inside was a chess set. Such a marvel of craftsmanship. A minuscule fretwork of lace at the white queen's neck. The black queen adorned with a filigree train. Knights with teeth bared in tiny, terrifying grins. Every pawn different in some delightful detail. An eye patch, an ivory scowl, a clenched fist the size of a pinhead. For a few minutes, I was lost, entranced, wanting only to explore and marvel over each perfect piece. Then I noticed their silence. Something stirred me to provoke them. How kind of the Sultan. Father said, I suppose we must accept it. Of course I must. It would be terribly rude to refuse such a magnificent gift. Don't you think this has gone far enough, said Martha Milton. And father, my father, the doctor, my lion-hearted father, whom everyone respects and obeys, looked miserable and confused. And for that, I hated Martha Milton. going to read just a tiny bit from quite a large book. Um, it's a book that, that comes in many forms with some quite extraordinary pages. Um, there's prose, there's prose poetry, there's lots of experiments. Please welcome Adam Craig.
second, second hardback. It's the, um, I usually have a great long spiel trying to explain this book, but I have to speed it up. Um, Vetus Bering, actually, the title of the Vetus Bering refers to a guy called Vetus Bering, who was indeed an historical character. The character in my book has nothing to do whatsoever with the historical character of Vetus Bering, except that they're both seamen and explorers. The Vetus in this book dreams of a sea and a land on the shores of the sea, and he believes the dream so greatly that when he wakes up, he can't believe that the land and the sea are not there at all. So he goes looking for the land, and more specifically the sea, and what Vetus finds is an expanse of sand, and no sign of the sea anywhere at all. And it's really the sea that he's hoping to find. And he walks across this expanse of sand and trips over a standpipe. And this is what happens when Vetus decides that he's going to turn the standpipe on. Vetus turns. Vetus reaches out, turning. The bibcock squeaks, reaching out of the ground. Vetus, grasping. The bibcock, grip squeals, quavering as the valve gives, before freezing completely. Vetus, head down, bends closer. Tap, mouth down, bends not at all, but squeaks and trembles under this new Vetus grip. Valve, reluctant, just the same, a standpipe stuck, in the ground, under Vetus. Grasp, strained, teeth clenching head, cocked, mouth open, trembling, eyes slit, trembling, one drop, trembles, falls, becoming a dark circle on pebbles and sand, on not sky and not moving, not budging, mouth still, dry, largely, squeak turning as turned, grasp, straining against bibcock, stopcock, all stuck, vetus grunting, squeak, gib, squeak, gib, welling at the corner of one mouth, swelling, becoming a second drop. Vetus gripped, mouth shuddering, pebbles and sand under mouth changing colour. Let that happen again. Drop. Let that happen. Drop. Let that drop. Let drop. Let droplet. Let drop. Let drop. Let droplet. 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 Drap. Drip. Drap. Flowing. Beginning to flow more freely, if spluttering, airlock knocking, gush spluttering over pebbles and sand, sand and pebbles turning darker, glistening, although the light hasn't changed these last few minutes. Stopcock, open, bibcock, nattering, and Vetus, Vetus is gripped, can no longer let go, despite his feet becoming so very not dry. His legs, likewise, not dry, extraordinarily not dry. Mouth open, gushing, puddle spreading, rising faster too, so in no time it's hard to tell sky from land, land from non-sky, sky from not land, everything moving, flowing, foaming a little, but certainly flowing, so it isn't so easy to tell Vetus from not Vetus, mouth open and head down, head down and lips wet, reaching out of the rising water, standpipe and Vetus, Vetus and standpipe, head down and open mouths, wet, so why not believe it was like this all along? Standpipe bends, taking hold of the Vetus and straining, one hand gripping the other, the other gripping the Vetus tightly, mouth cocked but dry, standpipe teeth clenched, shoulders quivering until sound escapes downturned mouth, the Vetus shaking in reply, pushing back against standpipe's hands and refusing to budge, grip tightening, shoulders grunting, and mouth turned down, growing wet, wetter still behind clenched teeth. The Vetus turns turns faster, freely under standpipe's grip, mouth gushing over pebbles, over sand turning dark and splashing. Vetus flows in runnels, becoming pools, pools coming together to reflect the sky. Vetus flows in rivulets, streams weaving between the pebbles, coming together, together to form currents, fingertips reaching out, flexing. Vetus gushes from the Vetus. Vetus washes. Vetus rising higher, pools into ponds, currents into spaces that had been dry, not wet, for a long, long time, not counted. Vetus flows, moving, not still, under sky, but not land, over land, but not sky. Vetus spreading, borders stretching out, growing deeper so the pebbles and sand are absorbed, vanish beneath the lapping Vetus, waves beginning to turn across the face of this endless flow of Vetus, this Vetus, no, not Vetus, call it a sea. 
lurching out of its bed, gasping, dream, already fading, thankfully. Thank you very much. One of the wonderful things about kind of being based in North Wales is that you kind of get all these interlinks between people that just kind of arise quite spontaneously. And our next reader, Maria, did her PhD here at Aberystwyth with Matthew, I think. And won our pamphlet comp competition, which was adjudicated by Ian. Completely done blind. He didn't know who he was reading. Please welcome a very talented, rising poet, Maria Abakella. I was going to say, actually, it's <laughs> wonderful to be here because um, I lived in Aberystwyth for 10 years as a student. I've only just left, and Matthew Francis is my supervisor, so these poems, are, and he knows them very well and helps me a lot, encouraged me. Um, and then I'm very grateful also to Ian as well for, for allowing me to win this competition, and <laughs> it's very, I'm very happy about that. Um, so but I lived here for 10 years, and I studied... Um, so that meant I needed to have lots of jobs. So one of them was working in the cafe here in the art centre, uh, but another one was working as a, a well, like a warden um, in the halls of residence, and had lots of ups and downs that job, living with 18-year-olds. Um, and so I wanted to read a poem about one of the rooms that I spent a few years in. <coughs> and one of the um, tasks involved with being a warden was being on duty on the weekends occasionally, and that meant you weren't allowed to really leave your room, so it's like being under house arrest. <laughs> so, and, and, it was, and uh, for a period of time that was quite depressing, because one of the rooms that I was in during that time didn't have a window, so it was <laughs> not nice, and it was just up there. So, uh, okay, so this is called um, Solitude Sunday. <clears throat> if I smoked, now would be the time. I put a sock on the alarm and light up in my room with no windows. Yellowed breeze block, pocked with blue tack. Posters of Turner that hang gold framed in London. Snippets of prayers I say when I'm thought. I would let my breath stain these walls to grow in brown patches and hold the cells of me for someone else to scrub. I would lie sprawled on this spongy sofa that so many other backs have rested on, listening to records that others bought when new, Hawaiian waves, steel guitars, the afternoon hunching in on hazy itself. And the second poem I want to read is a love poem, um, and I want to dedicate it to my husband, who's here. I just married him in August. Uh, and, but... I did write this poem before I met him, <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's still dedicated to Andrea. Um, you're welcome. You've got Pentecostal hips. They swing and spin me like a prayer none but God was meant to catch. You've got broad Baptist shoulders. You sling the weight of my name across the C of your chest, and you run quick in your Salvation Army boots. In the light of morning, your mouth is all spirit and flesh. You are fundamental in all you do. The heart of you is Jew. The core and beat of you is blessed. Blessed are you, my tribe of one. You are a congregation of Anglican veins, weaving red secrets deep inside the moving map of your body. You've got Catholic hands. You reach and give and smooth. And when you nick your finger on a knife, your blood streams orthodox. You hold my gaze from the east till I laugh. You call to me from the west. If I turn to the south, you are there, smiling. Even in the chipped northern hills, I find you setting up a table for me, lighting candle after candle, pouring cups of wine. I murmur songs, you sashay about. How good it is to be loved by you. How wonderful is the sound of your voice. I want to give you all my strength. You, my duty. You, my joy. Thank you.
comes with, I think, our newest book in our 10th anniversary year. It's a fantastic novel. It's Ian's second novel with us. We're going to be taken back to Cambodia in 1962, where the world is not quite as we might think we knew it, because Peter Cook has had a bit of a crisis and has gone into the diplomatic service instead of becoming a comedian. <laughs> Please welcome <laughs> Ian Gregson. Uh, the most um, important idea in all my writing is the point where two voices collide with each other, two voices meet or interpenetrate or overlap um, or struggle with each other. Uh, and this is a, it's a political, it's, it's a political thing. Uh, and that's, mo that's very obvious in Wales where you know, the Welsh language struggles with English. Um, in, terms of, in terms of comedy, uh, which is what I'm doing in this novel to some extent, it's about the this is about the politics of comedy, and the point where voices overlap in comedy is most obvious in what you might call the double impersonation, where, for example, I saw John Cleese once impersonating um, Neville Chamberlain, impersonating Groucho Marx. <laughs> so, <laughs> Neville Chamberlain he had his umbrella and he was doing Groucho Marx type things um, with it. So, um, and my first TV memory, I think, is of Peter Sellers as Laurence Olivier's Richard III doing the Beatles' Hard Day's Night, <laughs> where he has a crown and a tunic and he's hunched over and he's saying... It's been a hard day's night, and I've been working like a dog. But when I get home to you, I find the things that you do make me feel all right. Um, so that, that double impersonation is something that occurred to me to do with Peter Cook, um, who, and in terms of the struggle I was talking about before, I have replaced in Britain by the way, in these political terms, by a um, wish fulfillingly, um, because Peter Cook was essentially a um, bland member of the English establishment when it came down to it, wish fulfillingly re re replaced as, as a comedian by an angry Welsh nationalist who I invented called Waldo Vaughan. Um, in this particular scene, previously Peter Cook has done his Elvis Presley impersonation, which was he used to do and which was terrible apparently because he had no sense of rhythm um, or you know he just couldn't sing either I don't think um, so but he's about to do that at the 50th birthday party of the ambassadress um, Edith Hartnell um, but in the diplomatic bag they sent a General de Gaulle uniform instead um, so <coughs> He improvises on on that basis. It, the scene the scene is observed from the point of view of the head of Chancery, uh, Wilfred Jamie, who doesn't like Cook uh, and is very sceptical about him. So he's appalled when he sees him go up next to the piano wearing this uniform. Wilfred was alarmed when he saw the secretary replaced by Peter Cook wearing the de Gaulle uniform and astonished when, despite that costume, Keith, Keith um, is the pianist, launched into an Elvis Presley tune, and Cook pouted and gyrated his hips inside the absurdly long and buttoned-up trench coat, and shouted, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, with a haughty demeanour and a French accent. The younger embassy staff thought this was hilarious, and so too tentatively did some others of the guests, but Wilfred thought it preposterous. Many of the older people present watched with open-mouthed disbelief, and Bill Noon looked thunderous. Cook was some sort of chimera, a hybrid of Elvis and de Gaulle, or de Gaulle in the process of transforming into Elvis Presley. And Wilfred was angry that something as grotesque as this was dominating Edith's par party. Even so, 
there was something arresting about it, something obviously superior to Cook's simple Elvis Presley mimicry. Because now his lack of rhythm and his inability to carry a tune <laughs> seemed part of the de Gaulle element, part of the general's woeful inability to do rockabilly vocals. The version of Heartbreak Hotel started out with the usual words about finding a place to dwell on Lonely Street, but then Cook was singing that he, de Gaulle, had fought a war in Indochina and got himself a shiner and was feeling sadly minor. And in the next verse, he was bemoaning how he'd had to leave Algeria and was becoming more and more inferior. And all the time he was intoning this, the two stars on his flat hat were glinting in the electric light, and Cook was gyrating and replacing Elvis Presley's throatly, throaty American uh, 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 with a French an, an, an. Thank you. <laughs> The other wonderful thing about working with a press over 10 years is seeing how writing develops. And Sue and I have been working together since almost the very beginning of Cinnamon Press. And this is her third collection with us. Each one gets even more stunning. They really are extraordinary. And also, the last two have these beautiful etchings from Pat Gregory. Please welcome Susan Richards. a pleasure to be uh, involved with Cinnamon Press from almost the start, ten years ago. I'd like to share a couple of poems from Skin Dancing, the third collection that Jan just mentioned, uh, which is themed, or the main theme is human-animal metamorphosis and shape-shifting, as inspired by a whole range of different myths and fairy tales from different cultures, um, Inuit, Norse, Celtic, Native American, and also my own personal experience of and training in shamanic trance dance and uh, shamanic journeying. And the first poem in the collection is uh, inspired by a French tale called The White Doe. And it follows quite a traditional Western fairy tale model in that a child is born, cursed at birth, by a witch who says that um, unless her parents manage to shield her from sunlight for the first 21 years of her life, she will be transformed into a deer um, and be forced to roam the forests for all eternity. However, if her parents manage to shield her from the sunlight for 21 years, she will grow up to marry a handsome prince and live happily ever after. So her parents do their utmost to keep her out of the sun, and they manage to do this for 20 years and 364 days. And on that crucial final day on her 21st birthday, she's engaged to a prince, um, she's riding in a carriage to the palace to be married, and of course, inevitably, um, sunlight pierces the shutter of the carriage, falls on her face, and the witch's prophecy is fulfilled, and she becomes a doe, a white doe in the forest. And of course, the prince comes to the rescue, um, breaks the curse, and they all live happily, if rather boringly, ever after. Um, in my version of the tale, the poem, poem version, um, I wanted to uh, try and show that, as a doe, she has a far happier and more fulfilling life than she ever would have if she'd lived in a palace with a prince. As transformations go, this has no more daunt than the suddening of blood and breasts. It's horizontal at its best, belly hammocked between four legs instead of back trapped, compliant wifing. Though my hands have hooved, they're now attuned to fungus rub and moss. My teeth are flossed heavily. I splurge through burns, and I've learnt to ask the sun to fondle flank after 21 dark, cursed years. Birch bark tonguing me, crossbills beaking pine seeds tweakily from cones, ground smelling rowan berrily with otterness. Ear twitch to a cracklish sound, worker ants nest mounding. All such a gorgeous, not even the flies round my side head eyes can undear me now. At last I can be forgettish, no more bracelets, grammar, manners, standard lamp strip lights, no more room fug of stew and my stale mother's breath, no more lonelies and you freaking, no more curtains, shutters, blinds. 
Instead, my hind minds ferned with ancient memories of wolf and the urge to never still. Though the man I was meant to wed turns hunter, I will outwood him. For an unlife in the unlight has taught me slinkness and how to happy ever after when I tell me tales. Thank you. Uh, my second and final poem, uh, I suppose, best illustrates the second theme which is running through the book, which is that of um, animals and language, and the tired old argument that um, animals are superior to human beings because of the... Oh, sorry, an human beings are superior to animals um, because uh, we have language with which to communicate. Um, and so I wanted to grapple with this idea in a number of poems. And also, in this particular one, look at the... Um, famous quote by philosopher Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. Uh, and, um, and also have some fun with uh, cultural references around lions. If a lion could speak, we'd hear how Kruger has flattened his bowels, how Longleats left him with a lisp, how he's zoo mute, and how his tamer wields a whip, then delves between his jaws to extract the stammer. If a lion could speak, we'd correct his grammar, purge his syntactical savanna of herds of double negatives, then wince if he ripped apart just one infinitive. If a lion could speak, he'd sphinx talk about the thorn in his paw, how MGM lips synced his roar, and how Albert gave him heartburn for weeks. If a lion could speak, we may deign to reply, though very loud and slow, like a lion's really a scarecrow in disguise. If a lion could speak, we'd insist he use English, but he'd cleave to lionese. The few of us who'd learned cheetah might grasp the lack of past and future tense, while the rest would remain baffled, more concerned to learn how to order a beer in giraffe. If a lion could speak, we'd tire of his whinges of wardrobes and witches, of how Richard filched his heart and how his rampant act on flats has knackered his hips. In time, we'd surely ignore him, drawn to the wit of warthogs or antelope banter instead. If a lion could speak, he'd say, take a degree in my language of strangling ungulates and wrangling with vultures for the meat. Then we'll talk. Thank you all very much. It's an extraordinarily rapid tour of, I think, 12 people who've read this evening. Sadly, Fiona Owen couldn't be here this evening because she's got terrible flu, and Rosalind Huddis couldn't be here this evening because her mum died just last week, so she's kind of thought about it this week and thought it probably wasn't the best place to be. But do take a look at their books, The Green Gate and Tilt, which are extraordinary poetry. A huge thank you to Simon and to all of you for being such a fantastic audience. And let's say thank you to everybody that read. Now then, Jan thinks we're finished, <laughs> but we're not. <laughs> Um, I think us uh, cinema writers just wanted to take the opportunity really to, <laughs> to thank Jan. I personally, uh, just speaking for myself, am more than just a little bit in awe of this woman, I think, really. I, I know a little bit about um, how uh, cinema and press was started and, you know, from its, its very humble roots ten years ago to, to what cinema and press is today. I know Jan is publishing at the moment probably more than 25 books a year um, from such a variety of authors from, from all over the place, um, etc. And again, just speaking from my own point of view, um, I had only dreamed of being an author, really. Um, I met Jan, I think, I can't remember what year, it was um, 2010 or 11, something like this, um, at one of the writing um, retreats that Jan runs in North Wales and from my experience I'd been doing the rounds of publishers and agents etc etc as as most writers do um, and having plenty of rejections 
But what I found in Jan was someone who did in fact reject my book in the beginning, thanks. <laughs> but supportively and with encouragement and with advice and what Jan taught me on that group and, and since really in terms of um, the editing process etc is how to, to take an idea or a spark of idea and turn it into something that's marketable and interesting and um, interesting enough for other people to want to read in a sense and so I personally have learned a huge amount from Jan. Um, I'm about to have my, my second novel published and that certainly wouldn't have happened with, without this woman and without Cinnamon Press and so I know from personal experience the support and the encouragement and the dedication and the sheer hard work really that this woman puts into Cinnamon Press and making it the 10 years later success that, that it is today is, is something really quite remarkable um, and I'm absolutely convinced that the other cinnamon writers here feel the same way so I don't know if the other cinnamon writers want to stand up as well and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and help me to say thank you